go into the world and tell every man that you meet there is a man on the cross a catholic take what you need to know right now a bold synthesis of inspiration and information keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous catholic perspective a Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. The communist persecution, prosecution, persecution. I mean, really, let's just be honest. That's what's going down for Jimmy Lai in Hong Kong right now. We're going to be catching up with Mark Simon, former Apple Daily executive and good friend of Jimmy Lai. And we're going to be talking about the trial. What's at stake? What could he be facing? Life in prison, really? Well, we're going to get the latest on that with Mark Simon at 30 past the hour. Brent Haynes is back on the program. He wants to weigh in on Trump being removed from the ballot in Colorado, while Texas AG Ken Paxton is calling for removing Biden from the primary in 2024. Ought to be interesting. Brent Haynes will be here to weigh in on all of that at uh, 14 past the hour. Lots of stories in the news that we are covering for you. We're going to link to everything in the show notes for you today over at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. You'll find the show notes there. You can also get signed up to our insider email list with, which comes with, uh, you know, benefits. Praise be to God. Glad you're on the inside. So thank you for doing it. The station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. Don't forget. You can also still watch the documentary film, the, uh, the the secret of the saints in the end times, and it's uh, free right now on ICR Plus. Go to the station of the cross dot com forward slash ICR Plus, or just watch it on your ICR your iCatholic Radio mobile app in your iOS or Android app store. Search for iCatholic Radio. ICR Plus is in the bottom right corner there. Let's pray. Let's get started in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember. O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful, O Mother of the Word incarnate. Despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your Saint of the Day. Saint Thomas, pray for us. Thomas, also called Didymus, or Twin, according to the Gospels, is most famous for his episode of doubt upon hearing of the resurrection. After Pentecost, Thomas preached the Gospel throughout the Middle East, into Persia, and eventually even India. It is most likely there that he received his crown of martyrdom, and all the Eastern traditions agree that he was run through with spears and lances by the soldiers of a pagan ruler. His relics were later translated to Edessa. Ancient tradition holds that Thomas baptized the Magi during his travels in the East, and several of the Eastern Catholic churches trace their history and liturgical rites directly back to St. Thomas's mission or to his immediate successors. Dom Prosper Garanger recommends asking for the fitting intercession of St. Thomas in this last week of Advent, to increase our faith in the coming of our Lord as a poor, humble infant, and to decrease our human tendency to doubt. In the modern calendar, and some others, St. Thomas is celebrated on July 3rd. Thanks to some of the pious stories regarding his efforts in India, Thomas is a patron of architects and builders. St. Thomas, pray for us. And now, your headline news. The Hill reports, Holly blocks McConnell-backed nominees, escalating feud. Senator Josh Hawley from Missouri is throwing a wrench into Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell from Kentucky in his effort to confirm two former aides to the Federal Trade Commission and the National Transportation Safety Board, escalating a feud between the first-term conservative senator and the veteran party leader. Hawley informed McConnell in a letter Wednesday that he wants more time to vet the McConnell-backed nominees, who were slated to be approved by unanimous consent along with a slate of Biden nominees. The Daily Wire is reporting Biden DOJ sues Colony Ridge for bait-and-switch sales and predatory financing. 
The Biden administration's Department of Justice and Consumer Protection Financial Bureau are suing Colony Ridge, the massive development north of Houston, Texas, that has become a magnet for illegal aliens. The suit, announced Thursday and filed in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Texas, states that massive housing developments sold plots of flood-prone land without water, sewer, or electrical infrastructure, all while exploiting a language barrier at the expense of customers. And ACI Africa is reporting blessings for same-sex unions of any kind are not permitted in Malawi. Catholic bishops in Malawi have prohibited the implementation of the Vatican Declaration on the Blessing of Same-Sex Couples and Couples in Other Irregular Situations, which the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, or the DDF, released on Monday under the title of Fiducia Supplicans. In a two-page statement dated Tuesday, December the 19th, members of the Episcopal Conference of Malawi offer, quote, clarification on the declaration on the pastoral meaning of blessings, fiducia supplicans, close quote, and prohibit the practice of such blessings in this Southern African nation. Times, they're heating up, aren't they? The vision is getting ever, ever more clearer, I would say. And those, those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 45. Mary set out in those days and traveled to the hill country in haste to a town of Judah where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leapt in her womb and Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Ghost, cried out in a loud voice and said, Most blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For at the moment the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the infant in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed are you who believed that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. A Catholic commentary on Holy Scripture said, Unlike Zachary, Mary has asked for no sign, though, unlike Zachary, she receives a sign. Um, well, he received one, too, but because of his, his lack of faith, she receives one because of her faith. Let that sink in. Clear distinction. Mary's charity, it goes on to say, provides an occasion for the meeting of the chief actors in the drama and for the supernatural intervention by which Elizabeth and her son are moved to acknowledge and pay homage to Mary's child. The Ignatius Catholic Study Bible says Elizabeth's experience parallels that of Rebecca and Genesis 25. Both Luke and the Greek Old Testament use the same verb to describe children leaping or stirring in the womb as Rebecca's experience signaled the preeminence of Jacob over his older brother Esau, Genesis 25, verses 22 through 23. So the similar experience of Elizabeth was a sign that Jesus would be greater than his older cousin John. Isn't that interesting? Elizabeth blesses Mary with words once spoken to Jael and Judith in the Old Testament, Judges 5. These women were blessed for their heroic faith and courage in warding off enemy armies hostile to Israel. Victory was assured when both Jael and Judith assassinated the opposing military commanders with a mortal blow to the head. Ooh, crushing the head? Are you suggesting that it would be the seed of the woman from Genesis 3 that would crush the head of the serpent? Hmm, maybe uh, Revelation 12 comes to mind. Anyone? Anyone? Mary will follow in their footsteps, yet in her case, both the enemy destroyed and the victory won will be greater, for she will bear the Savior who crushes the head of sin, death and the devil underfoot. Isn't that something? The mother of my Lord, this title reveals the twin mysteries of Jesus' divinity and Mary's divine maternity. Note that every occurrence of the word Lord in the immediate and surrounding context refers to God. Mary's divine motherhood was the first Marian dogma expounded by the church. The Ecumenical Council of Ephesus, A.D. 431, defined her unique relationship to Christ 
and honored her with the title of Mother of God. Uh, close quote, the uh, Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. But I think I've told you this, I don't know, seven or 10 billion times before, but you need to look at the parallels between 2 Samuel 6 and and this passage in Luke's gospel. Because David, bringing up the, the Ark of the Covenant after having received it back from the Philistines on a cart, nonetheless, David doesn't give it to the priest to carry on poles like he was commanded to in the book of Exodus. No, instead he leaves it on the cart and he's preceding it with dancing and joy and leaping and all that. And uh, they hit a bump and Uzzah reaches up his hand to touch it, to steady it. And he dies on the spot because nothing unclean can be, can be united to the pure. If you aren't purified, you can't be in the pure, right? You don't get to be in the garden of Eden if you've committed a sin and haven't been purified. You got to get out. Get out. There's a man with the fiery sword. There's an angel with the fiery sword there to block the way because you're not allowed in because you are impure. If you tried to stay, you would be totally consumed by the fire of God's love and there'd be nothing left. St. Paul would say, wood, straw, stubble, hay, all that stuff gets burned up and is gone. What's left? Gold, silver, purity. You got to have something left after the fire of purification. This is why Revelation 21, 27 says nothing unclean will enter it. You do not get to go to heaven unless you've been purified. But what does the deeper meaning suggest? That Our Lady, in comparing these two passages, is the Ark of the New Covenant. And if that box laid over with gold is pure, how much more the Mother of our Savior, Jesus Christ, how much more the Queen of Heaven and Earth is truly pure, who gets to be in the Garden of Eden. Let's pray about that. We'll be right back. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Mark Simon, a former executive at Apple Daily, is going to be on at 30 past the hour to talk about Jimmy Lai. He is facing a life sentence. What is the deal there? This is a guy who is a convert to the Catholic faith. Could have left. He's a dual citizen of uh, England and, uh, and, and China, I guess, Hong Kong. He has lots of money. He could have easily left and saved himself, saved his family, but he to stay. He chose to face it. Why? Why did he do that? What's at stake? What are we going to learn about that from Mark Simon coming up at 30 past the hour? Do join us for that if you can. Lots of stories in the news, of course, that are always a great concern to me, and I'm sure they are to you as well. We will be linking to all of them over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash A-C-T. But Catholic attorney and freedom fighter Brent Haynes is on the team today. Good morning to you, Brent. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, everybody. Praise be to God. Always glad to have you on the team. Hey, by the way, I don't know if you heard. I saw this this morning. I think I saw it this morning anyway. Uh, I think it was uh, A.G. Ken Paxton in the state of Texas, the People's Republic of Texas. If I'm not mistaken, he said something about, well, maybe if they're going to remove Trump off the ballot in Colorado, we should remove Biden off the ballot in Texas. I mean, that's kind of a big story, isn't it? Well, I thought of that result, you know, when I heard this. uh, The people who advocate these actions just never seem to stop and think about what would happen if the shoe were on the other foot. And the best real world example that will, in fact, in part have consequences on this decision is when the Democrat controlled Senate decided to change the rules on how many votes were needed to put a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. And they did that. And then a few years later, when the Republicans were in control and there was a chance to put a Republican on the Supreme Court by following that lower vote standard, Republicans did it. And the Democrats didn't like that. It's just that they never think of that. Um, All of this, of course, is bad for the country because it attacks our fundamental organizing principles that distinguish us as a civilized society of law and order where we can resolve disputes peacefully and rationally. So um, it's a. it's not a surprising decision given the atmosphere by the Colorado Supreme Court, you know, given the atmosphere 
uh, uh, some of the actions that have uh, started in the country in the last few years. But just so we catch everybody up, the Colorado Supreme Court decided in a narrow four to three decision that President Trump cannot be on the ballot in Colorado because he participated in the, as they call it, the January 6th insurrection. Their decision is based on the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was passed at the end of the Civil War, and it was intended to keep former Confederate officers in from the Confederate military, the Confederate Army, really, they didn't have much of a Navy, um, from serving in the United States government. And extreme activists on the political left who aren't extreme in the sense that they have broad, broad support in their party and in, and in a, a lot of the institutions in the country, such as the Colorado Supreme Court, uh, they have brought lawsuits in several states around the country to try to keep Trump off of the ballot, to deny people the right to vote for Trump by claiming that, well, he participated in this so-called insurrection. And I say, as an aside, I say so-called insurrection, Joe, because I didn't see anybody with any firearms on January 6th. I didn't see any tanks. You know, I, di I didn't see any military units marching on the Capitol to take the Electoral College hostage. But leaving that point aside for a moment, um, they decided four to three they participated in the insurrection and therefore uh he is not to be allowed on the ballot so yeah joe, joe consider this trump has been is being sued or being prosecuted in several several courts around the country in washington dc the special federal prosecutor jack smith had trump indicted he went before the washington dc grand jury he had trump indicted and what did he indict him for? Technically the grand jury, but what are the charges that Jack Smith is prosecuting Trump for? Election interference, not insurrection. So a federal prosecutor with all of the resources of the federal government, coming out of the Department of Justice, which is where he's from, that's his background, coming out of the Department of Justice, which has taken a very hostile view toward Trump in a favorable jurisdiction, because they can't find a more favorable jurisdiction for their views in Washington, D.C., which is 92% Democrat. A federal prosecutor with all of those resources in the most favorable jurisdiction possible did not even seek an indictment on insurrection. And yet yeah. these people filed these lawsuits around the country, and the Colorado Supreme Court decided four to three uh, to uh, grant, they overruled the trial court. The trial court said no, uh, this doesn't apply. That that provision does not apply to him. Colorado Supreme Court decided four to three. Yes, it does, and they issued the decision. Now, the Colorado Supreme Court stayed their decision, or in other words, they put it on hold until January fourth, or uh, if there is an appeal, because they know there's going to be an appeal, and they know that the Supreme sure. Court almost certainly will take the case and will grant a stay. Now, that date is important because January fifth is Colorado's deadline for printing ballots. Uh, there are reasons you have to have the ballot done in advance. You know, a lot of them just obvious logistical and practical reasons. For example, mailing ballots to men and women in the military who are entitled to vote and serve in places all around the world. So there are reasons for getting the ballot done early. Um, Trump's lawyers, no doubt, will follow their appeal quickly. Um, most legal experts that I've seen discussing this, and I think really any reasonable attorney would expect that the United States Supreme Court would have to take this case. And the real question is, uh, they're probably going to overrule it, but the real question is, and this has also been discussed, is will it be a nine to zero decision? The mm. Supreme Court has a history of ruling in cases that are just critical for the country, of trying to, of, of, Seeking, and usually it's Chief Justice, of course, who, who tries to, to shepherd it this way because he is the Chief Justice. But they try to come down with nine to zero decisions so that the country will see that the court is united on what is an important and controversial decision. And we're talking about uh, the big example here being Brown versus the Board of Education when they ruled that schools had to be desegregated. Had to be desegregated. So, uh, you know, there are probably going to be six votes at least uh, with the conservatives or conservatives and moderate conservatives on the court voting to overturn Colorado. I would expect to see uh, Justice Kagan to rule against Colorado. The real questions will be Sotomayor. 
And then, of course, our newest justice who says she can't, uh, even though she's a woman, says she can't define what a woman is. Probably there will be decisions soon, but there's no guarantee. And, you know, it could get delayed. Another interesting point is this decision only applies to the primary ballot. And it's possible that the Republican Party in Colorado will just say, well, forget that. We won't hold a primary. We will hold a caucus. And then they could have caucuses, as Iowa has presidential caucuses. Trump would presumably win in those caucuses. And then this question would start all over again uh, for the ballot for the general election. But it could just be that the Supreme Court will issue a decision and issue a decisive decision that will stop this in Colorado and stop it all across the country. So Mm. that's what we're looking at. But, Joe, as you know, even though we're approaching Christmas and it's only a few days away, uh, politics certainly doesn't stop. I know you (laughs) talked about the uh, Boston mayor holding I did, a yeah. party for, you know, electeds of color. Ele- I, did, I like that. Electeds of color. I should get a T-shirt and, that says that. You know, when you hear people talk about this and they focus on the fact that they're discriminating against other people, namely white people. I haven't heard a lot of discussion about, you hear a little, some discussion, but I haven't heard a lot of discussion about this in the context of comparing it to what we used to desire, a colorblind society, for some discussion about, about that. But the That's how I was I raised. For you, I, well, exactly. It's the way I was raised. And by the way, and I'll leave the theology to you and your theology experts, but we know that as Christians, we're not supposed to judge people by color, despite the awful examples in history of Christians acting contrary to that. We know as Christians, as, as Catholics, that we're not supposed to treat people like that. But here's Here's the question uh, that I haven't heard many people talk about. When it comes to the people who advocate this kind of action, such as a, a party, an elected party, a, a party for electeds who are you know, only of a certain minority or, or minorities only, mm. what is their ultimate goal, Joe? What will society look like? When that view prevails, if they have their way and that view prevails, and people need to think about that, because if they have their view, what does society look like, Joe? Is it a society of, of uh, cordiality and, and civilized people behaving politely and rationally, uh, much less with Christian love toward one another, you know, Christian charity? No, it's a society that is divided into groups. It's a society that's divided into tribes, factions, filled with friction and tension and resentment and envy. What kind of society is that? What is their end goal, Joe? Yeah, not a good one. How do they get around all of this? They're they're oppressor versus oppressed, you know, prism of looking at the world can only lead to just perpetual tension and turmoil. There is no peace and there's no joy for these people in their worldview. Mm. Yeah, and so, you know, thank and, God, literally thank and God. And she's married to a Caucasian, so I'm, I'm just real curious. I'm, I'm, what would he say about all that? Well, how does he feel that his his spouse holds uh, non-white parties? You're, if you're white, you're not involved. You can't be invited. I mean, he must feel like, yikes, what does that, what does that uh, mean for me and for our children? Like, I wonder what he's thinking today. But we're going to run out of time here with Brent Taines, uh, Catholic attorney and freedom fighter. There is, there is some good news. Let's end on a positive note here. we got about a minute and a half left. Three wins for houses of worship in Texas and California. What's the story here? And, Joe, this is just one example. It, it's good for us to mention these uh, but real quickly. Um, there are constant fights around the country uh, on the religious freedom issue. And First Liberty Institute, which is headquartered near Dallas, Texas, is like the Alliance Defending Freedom and other groups like the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, too many to to mention now. They're always in the trenches and and basically in the courts or in the city halls fighting these things. People can check this out on their website. Here's an egregious example. Uh, In Beverly Hills, there were efforts by the city government against a rabbi uh, on celebrating Hanukkah. And the city officials began investigating this rabbi. They've been doing it since March. They even did surveillance of people going to and from his home and cars, and they flew a drone overhead. Oh, wow. 
So this one, did, it, it appears this one didn't even need to go to court. A lot of times when, when, and when governments, especially local governments, get out of control doing these things, a lot of time, all, times all that ne- is necessary is for a well-worded, uh, sort of stern letter from some, from some, you know, intelligent, you know, competent, accomplished attorneys to remind them of certain constitutional rights, and the uh, the uh, first liberty lawyers uh, got Gibson and Dunn, or Gibson Dunn and Crutch, where a huge law firm got involved, and Beverly Hills backed down. Wow. So our Jewish sisters involved in that incident are able to enjoy their constitutional rights and their religious freedom despite the intentions of their local government. So another victory on the legal front, Joe. Well, that is good news. Praise be to God. And uh, we're out of time. Brent Haynes, Catholic attorney and freedom fighter. Always glad to have you on the team and covering some of these stories for us. Uh, We won't see you, I guess, for another couple of weeks now. Merry Christmas to you, Brent. Happy Advent to you and everybody. And Merry Christmas to everyone, Joe. All right, praise be to God. Coming up after the break, let's talk about Jimmy Lai. What's at stake for him? Life in prison, really? What's the lowdown? We're going to get that with Mark Simon. All coming up, plus news and more after the break. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network presents Saints and Seasons. On December 21st, we celebrate the feast of St. Thomas, Apostle. Thomas, also called Didymus, according to the Gospels, is most famous for his episode of doubt upon hearing of the resurrection, his repentant confession of faith upon seeing the risen Lord and his holy wounds, my Lord and my God, is the indulgence prayer recommended to Catholics for silent internal recitation upon beholding the real presence themselves at Holy Mass. After Pentecost, Thomas preached the Gospel throughout the Middle East and eventually India, and received his crown of martyrdom after being run through with lances at the order of an idolatrous king. Ancient tradition holds that Thomas baptized the Magi during his travels in the East, and several of the Eastern Catholic churches trace their history and liturgical rites directly back to St. Thomas's mission and his successors. Dom Prosper Garanger recommends asking for the fitting intercession of St. Thomas in this last week of Advent to increase our faith in the coming of our Lord as a poor, humble infant, and to decrease our human tendency to doubt. In the modern calendar, as well as some others, St. Thomas is honored on July 3rd. Also celebrated today are St. Peter Canisius in the modern calendar, St. Themistocles, St. Severin, and many other martyrs, confessors, and holy virgins. For more about the saints and seasons of the Catholic Church, visit thestationofthecross.com forward slash saints and seasons. Jesus Christ, welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. Breitbart reports, new Polish globalist government shuts down TV channels, sacks media company bosses. The new Polish culture ministry announced Wednesday it had fired the heads of several broadcasters, the management and supervisory boards of Television Poland, Polish Radio, and the Polish Press Agency were all dismissed. Police were seen entering the headquarters of TVP on Wednesday, and the broadcast was taken off air with the output of a substitute channel being broadcast instead. Members of the outgoing Law and Justice Party who governed Poland for the past eight years attempted to protest the strike by a sit-in, but it didn't work because they took him down anyway. And Just the News reports, senators leave Capitol Hill for winter recess without passing Ukraine aid. The Senate passed a bill temporarily authorizing the Federal Aviation Administration to continue, but failed to pass a bill involving funding for Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, and the U.S. border. While going on winter recess, the senators and the Biden administration plan to work on the agreement together through the end of the year with plans to introduce the bill at the beginning of next. And NBC News is reporting Xi warned Biden during the summit that Beijing will reunify Taiwan and China. Chinese President Xi Jinping bluntly told President Joe Biden during the recent summit in San Francisco that Beijing will reunify Taiwan with mainland China, according to three current and former U.S. officials. The Chinese leader also referenced public predictions by U.S. military leaders who say that Xi plans to take Taiwan in 2025 or 2027, telling Biden that they were wrong because he has not yet set a time frame. And those those are your headline news. 
And good morning to our iCatholic Radio listeners. Love having you guys on the team. Listen to Catholic Radio 24-7 anywhere on planet Earth. All you got to do is download the iCatholic Radio and mobile app. You can also get the ICR Plus in it right there in the app itself and watch the documentary film that we just released free of charge. It's all right there. Search for iCatholic Radio in your iOS or Android app store. Mark Simon joins us right now. He is a former executive of Apple Daily, personal friend of Jimmy Lai and their family, uh, also served our country in the U.S. Navy. Praise be to God. Mark, good morning to you. Thank you for your time today. Thanks so much. I actually worked for the Navy. I was a civilian employee. So um, <clears throat> there's probably a lot of debate whether I served the country <laughs> or did the country harm. So <laughs> well, there, there you go. We'll let, the, we'll let the taxpayers decide that, Mark. How about that? I, either way, okay. I do appreciate your time and uh, I appreciate your insight into the story over Jimmy Lai. Jimmy Lai is uh, an interesting character, to be sure, a convert to our Catholic faith. Uh, praise be to God. Uh, somebody who was intimately involved with uh, Cardinal Zen and the Catholic Church there, but somebody who has obviously a lot of money, capability, resources. He could have easily, I would argue, maybe you can correct me, I, I, he could have left. He could have saved his family, saved himself, lived comfortably uh, in the West. Why did he stay? Jimmy stayed, just to be blunt with you, uh, because he had a different term, but he said, I don't want to be a jerk. In other words, I've been on this road with these pe this pe the people of Hong Kong really since 1989, um, you know, in other words, as a democracy advocate and a leader of that movement. And to walk out their last minute, to leave the last minute when you, he's such a prominent person, and he knew where he stood with the mainland Chinese. In other words, Jimmy's, he, you know, he's not, he's not arrogant in any way, but he knows, look, I run the largest newspaper. And the other thing, too, is is if I leave, every time I leave, the moment I leave, the newspaper is closed within 30 days. Because wow. he can't ask people to sit there and take fire, you know, and and he was right. There are six of our people in jail, you know, in other words, six editors and, and, and are in jail. They were, they were slowly picked off. Um, so he stayed because in his mind, that was really the right thing to do. And it was the only thing to do as well. And and he had the opportunity to leave. There's no doubt about that. Did he support um, the victims of the 89 Tiananmen Square massacre? That's where he really got started. In other words, J Jimmy had a political awakening. Um, he always says, he said, I was focused on Hong Kong. I had come to Hong Kong as an immigrant. He was focused on money. He was focused on making a life. He was focused on the things that so many immigrants um, have happened in their lives when they come to a new country. And he was doing very, very well. There's no doubt about it. And he basically saw the Tiananmen massacre and he said it was like China was calling to him. Mm. You know, the, 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 the country was calling to him. He, he said, my ancestors were calling to me. And so lo and behold, he got involved. Um, he started making shirts. He owned a large uh, uh, outlet called Giordano. Um, he started making shirts, T-shirts. He sent up support uh, financially and also through tents uh, to, uh, to Tiananmen. Um, and when he did this, it became obvious that the Chinese authorities first became aware of him. He was also entering publishing at that time. He was moving from, um, he was moving from uh, uh, garments to publishing. And when you're in publishing... The simple fact of the matter is, in a free society, which Hong Kong some was back then, to be fair, you were going to run afoul of a communist regime. So he ran afoul of them really in nineteen in the nineteen eighty nine nineteen ninety. They they talked to him. People came to visit and said, "What are you doing?" But it was in nineteen ninety four when the break really happened, and that's when he wrote what we always said is the most expensive newspaper column in history, and I I, I guess until recently maybe. But he basically, uh, he wrote a column where he insulted the leader, Li Peng, for the Tiananmen Massacre, um, called him some rather nasty names. We are a tabloid. And um, after that point, they forced him to sell his company, Giordano. Wow. And that, that's, and that, that, really, that really kicked it off. Then in 1995, when Apple Daily came around, very quickly it became alternating between the number one and the number newspaper in, in Hong Kong. Then we went into Taiwan in 2003 uh, with uh, Next Magazine and then Apple Daily 
So Jimmy was fairly well established um, on the other side of the uh, line from the Chinese, communist Chinese. You know, okay, so as they saw that the lease, uh, you know, the British having control of Hong Kong was coming to an end and the communist government in China was going to take over, was there a sense that, like, uh, from the, the citizens of Hong Kong, did they think that they could continue in the same way? Did they know that big changes were about to happen? Were they embracing those changes? What was that like? I can't begin to understand as an outsider what that well, might have been like. I was, I'm was i so old. I was there. I, I actually came to Hong Kong in 1991. Um, and I was in, I was in, I was then based in the Philippines, but I had been in the Hong Kong until 1995, but I was back every, every two weeks because of the, my work. I was not working for Jimmy yet. There was great trepidation. Um, Jimmy fully expected to be in, in, fully expected to be arrested. I had two or three friends at that time who were involved in the democracy movement. They were expecting to be arrested. Previously to 1989, really, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, 1997, many people, as did Jimmy, uh, got passports overseas. Jimmy is a full British citizen. Just he's not a, he's not what you call a BNO passport holder, like a green card holder in America. Jimmy is a full British citizen, and he got that uh, in 1994 um, uh, from the uh, from the British government, and. Um, that's why the British government has finally started to step up for him now. But people knew it was coming. Hong Kong is a land of migrants and immigrants from the mainland. So in other words, there's very few Hong Kong people. In other words, there's mm. I, I know a few people who said, yes, my grandfather was born in Hong Kong, who are my age. Most people, their parents came over or they came over. Um, it's, 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 and it's still a heavy input. I mean, it's still something... I think it's something like 17, 18,000 a year come over the border. And that's been going on for 25, 30 years. The, the city constantly is pulling in migrants, immigrants from China. Um, Jimmy um, was part of that migrant that came across. His family had suffered greatly under the communist. So he knew what was coming. And, and, you know, when you talk to him and you know him as long as I have and you read his writings, he thought that in 1998, 19, he thought he'd make it to about 1998 before they went and closed Apple Daily down. But look, you have to be fair. They really kept their hands off Hong Kong in many, many ways, as much as could be expected up until, I'd say, 2012, 2013, when a certain gentleman showed up and his name is Xi Jinping. Mm. Was that a big change? I mean, that was like a, a major shift in change. policy and culture. Yeah, it's a complete sea change. Com complete. It's it's kind of like somebody walks in your room and you've been dealing with them all day long, and you look up and before you they they had a business suit on and they had all the, all the trappings of the West on when they dealt with you. Of course, they were a real pain in the butt to deal with, but you know you didn't have too many problems with them. And lo and behold. They come in one morning and they're wearing like the Mao suit. They've got the little red book in their hand and they're showing up for, they're showing up to bear. Xi Jinping is probably the most significant figure in Chinese history since Mao. And I, and I say that Deng Xiaoping, very significant, opened it up. This guy is very, very serious. I, I heard in the opening where Xi Jinping spoke to Biden. Um, now I've, my my opinion is following this and living in Taiwan. This is not new for Xi Jinping. I think it was just new that it was so blunt to President Biden. You know, he he's very very blunt. This is he's a true China nationalist. We have to remember that. And 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 that he he thinks China has been you know basically done hard by the West. But the people in Hong Kong, I think they basically had gritted their teeth and they said, all right, they're not going to kill the golden goose. We make a lot of money for them. We're very important, which they were correct. And the Chinese essentially took control politically and then just started playing around in, in the, in, in the side, on the side. But they never really stepped in and took control of the society until around 2011, 2012. When we had something called the National Patriotic Education Movement, it'd be like coming into our schools and saying, this is the new curriculum for national education, our version, you know, the sure. PLA, the uh, yeah. Communist Party version. 
Well, talk to me about uh, Jimmy Lai and Cardinal Zen. What was their relationship like? Well, I, it was fantastic. Um, um, National Catholic Register gave me the privilege yesterday. It just came out, a, a piece I wrote. I always view Jimmy Lai's Catholicism through Cardinal Zinn, because Cardinal Zinn brought him into the church. They're both very much the same people, and it's kind of unique. In, in the words, they both were born in China. Cardinal Zinn, born a Catholic, Jimmy, who later became a convert. There's about 14 years, 15 years difference in their ages, but they came up in basically the same time. Cardinal Zinn in the 1940s, which was a very, very rough time, and Jimmy in the 1950s which was a very rough time. These are tough guys. They are tough mm. men, but they're not tough in a brashness. Nay, they're not tough in violence. Their resoluteness is what always impresses me. They both basically have decided to walk the walk they're walking. They're, they show their faith every day. Jimmy's faith is not something that he sits in the past and has been so open about. In other words, we're, we're, I hate to say it, we're, we're a couple of media guys and, and construction guys. We don't talk about our faith all day long, but we do, you know, we show up to church, we show up to mass. Um, we're very conscious that our wives keep it in our homes. He, he's blessed with a very, very wonderful, a wonderful woman, uh, Teresa, who has really introduced him to Catholicism and expanded his world. But Cardinal Zinn and Jimmy, they are incredibly simple, non-complex men. I don't mean that that they're not educated. I mean, they're both, you can't even have a conversation with them sometimes. I tease them when I was out on the boat, they were talking about something and I said, you might as well be speaking in Klingon. Then I had to explain <laughs> to what Klingon was. And, and because they are that, they are that, they, they really are at a, at a different level in terms of their intellectual discovery. But they're also very simple, too. They're the guys. Hold that, that thought right there for me, Mark. Head. Hold that thought. We're right up against a hard break. Mark Simon, former executive at Apple Daily, is on with us. We're talking about Jimmy Lai. More on that coming up right after the break. I also want to get into what's at stake here. Could he really spend the rest of his life in prison? He's no spring chicken. So we're going to get that from Mark Simon coming up right after this break. Let us pray for Jimmy, for all of those people that are in prison there wrongfully. More coming up next. The Station of the Cross has many ways to keep you informed about our programming. You can view the highlights of our primetime programming schedule or the full 24-7 programming grid at both thestationofthecross.com or the free iCatholic Radio app. Just search under the programming tab. Our website also offers a printable version for your convenience. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. We're talking about Jimmy Lai. We're talking about his trial that he's undergoing. And, uh, you know, part of me just wonders if it's even a, like, is it fair? I mean, does he does he have a shot at, at to having a fair trial? I don't even know. All I know is from outside looking in what uh, what we hear about what goes down in China, Hong Kong, and uh, it makes me wonder whether or not Jimmy will get a fair shot. And Mark Simon, former executive of Apple Daily and personal friend to Jimmy and his family, is on with us to talk to him about talk about it. Mark, again, thank you for your time. Welcome back. Does he have a shot at a fair trial? Is that even possible in Hong Kong? No, not for national security charges. He's got a national security prosecutor. He's got the national security police. He's got national security judges. All these people are handpicked by Beijing. Wow. They're not just handpicked. They're scrutinized. They are selected for their loyalty. Um, the other day, the Secretary of Security bragged that he had a 100% conviction rate on national security charges. Of wow. course, he has a 100% conviction rate because it's in front of judges that do it. One of the mistakes sometimes that we make on the outside in dealing with the communist is we let them adopt our language. I think religious people can understand this, where we have people inside the church or other places who do the most damage. They use our language. 
The communist Chinese like to use the language in Hong Kong of a legal system. They like to have it presented that way. It is not a legal system that we would recognize once you go through it. Uh, I've been involved in it because of politics a couple of times. Um, I actually have warrants out on me. It's no, no secret there. But uh, because of the activities of, of the newspaper. Um, so I've seen it firsthand. Jimmy is basically up there because he fulfills a narrative. And, and I guess if your audience would follow this, essentially they have to have Jimmy Lai be convicted because Jimmy Lai is their entire linchpin in terms of arguing that there were foreign forces that were out to overthrow the Hong Kong government and cause problems for China. They cannot, in their ideology, allow the Hong Kong people to be thought that they have their own agency, that they mm -hmm. as individuals would choose democracy. So there has to be an outside influence. And that outside influence has to be Jimmy Lai. That outside influence has to be uh, other outsiders. Um, as we'll see, a lot of names came up from Mike Pence to uh, Jack Keane to other names come up. We're going to see a lot of people's uh, Luke DePulford, Benedict Rogers. All these people will be thrown in there, myself, as foreign agents. And that's the that's what's going to happen here. Jimmy is 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 really, to be perfectly honest with you, he has put himself out there. He has supported democracy for years. His newspaper has been a major thorn in the side, if not the sole thorn in the side, of the communist Chinese in Hong Kong and somewhat Taiwan. So now, you know, in their mind, it's time to pay the piper. The question is, is Jimmy Lai going to be sentenced to a sentence where, and they're going to carry it out where he does end up passing away in jail? He's 76. He has diabetes. He's a pretty hardy guy. I mean, there's, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a tough guy. He handles himself well in terms of his health, but you know, he's 76 and he's in a hard jail. Stanley prison was built and used by the Japanese. So it's not a pleasant place. He's not abused. I wouldn't, I would be very clear on that. The correctional services department doesn't abuse him, but it's a lousy place to be for a 76 year old guy. For sure. Why doesn't the Vatican support him? Him, Cardinal Zen, total silence in what's going on in China seems from uh, from the Vatican, from the hierarchy, from many bishops around the world. Why isn't there more support for Jimmy Lai? From the bishops, I think it's because they know the Vatican doesn't want them to support him. From the Vatican, it's all about one thing, the deal. And the deal basically leads you back to Cardinal Zen, who is opposed appeasement and opposed to the deal that was cut with the Vatican by Francis um, since day one. He's been vocal. He's been active. He is a very troublesome figure for the Vatican. Um, there is very little doubt that Francis uh, doesn't like him. We've seen what happens to cardinals that they don't like with Cardinal Burke and with others. And I think the fact of the matter is, is that I don't think they've intentionally done this, but they have abandoned Cardinal Zinn, they have abandoned Jimmy Lai, and they've abandoned a lot more Catholics. There's a lot of Catholics in jail. Catholics were a major part of the democratic movement and, and remain so. Mm. And what they've done is they've basically done that because of the deal. You know, everybody knows the deal where we'll open up China to Catholics, where the Catholic faith will be allowed to flourish under the Communist Party. This has been an utter disaster. There's nobody who even defends this anymore in the Vatican. They just want it to go away. But it's a sore spot. And we have, unfortunately, with Pope Francis, quite active solicitation of the Chinese Communist Party still. In a sh it may be, I'm sure you saw it, but a lot of people may have missed it. The Pope was in Mongolia. He brought up the two cardinals, one retired Cardinal Tung and the current active Cardinal, Cardinal Chow, to Mongolia where he basically told them you need to be good, have your flock be good citizens. In other words, he told wow. them to follow the Chinese Communist Party. Every, there was no other interpretation. There's no other anything. And when you get these guys from America Magazine and some of the other China, um, uh, some of the other panda huggers in the church who are over there, and they try to reinterpret it, it was not seen by anybody else but an Adam, Adam, you know, a way to make the, the Catholic Church in Hong Kong bow. And the problem you have is, Jimmy Lai and Cardinal Zinn are joined at the hip. 
They really are. Yeah. They're actually very good friends. It's not just a, a priest parish in a relationship. These men are good friends. And Cardinal Zinn, who showed up the other day, it was this amazing movie like walk almost. You see this man on a, on a cane walking up to the priest, and you actually see the police step back a little bit. Because wow. Hong Kong, a lot of people went to Catholic schools. Cardinal Zinn's a powerful figure. You see him come up. You see people almost looking around as if they can smooth the way for him. I tell people, it's an, I've spent a lot of time with Cardinal Zinn, um, and, and I love the guy. And he is an amazing man, and he is in many ways um, um, a, a, a man outside his church in Hong Kong because, of course, the priest – of there love him. The sisters love him. The, the fa- many of the faithful there love him, but he is a troublesome man. He's, he's problematic. It's one of the things we always forget about people. You know, when you go back and read the history of Poland or when you read the history of Eastern Europe, you can see that many of the activist priests, they were not always uh, warmly taken care of in their, in their local church because they were seen as trouble. Cardinal Zinn has that problem up at the Vatican and the real problem they have is, is that Francis, and I, I, I think they have no comprehension of how this is going to affect his legacy in China. He has abandoned Jimmy, and the communist Chinese know it. That's the worst thing about it. They know wow. there's no help coming to, to Jimmy Lai from, from Pope Francis. None. That's and, and that's That's a shame. That's really a shame. Yeah. It truly is. Uh, we're almost out of time here. Can I just ask, I think Cardinal Zen gets to visit Jimmy Lai. Is that true? Does he get to visit him in prison? And how does that go? Well, he gets to visit him every so often. Cardinal Zen's 92. He had a bit of a health problem a while ago. So he doesn't come always. He's He visits him when he's allowed to visit him. Uh, clergy is allowed in to see Jimmy. As I said, the Correctional Services Department um, does allow clergy in. The problem is the national security guys treat Cardinal Zinn because he also has charges against him, by the way. They just yeah. haven't prosecuted him. They, they're not that, they don't have that much nerve yet. Um, and he would happily take it. And he would happily wow. take it. In fact, he even tried a couple of times to get it. We know that. But people have talked him out of it. He's more valuable outside. But yeah, Unbelievable. he can see Jimmy when they allow him to see Jimmy, when they allow it. It's not an automatic. Mark. Mark Simon, thank you for your time. Thank you for your insight. Truly appreciated having you on and uh, providing some some information and context here for this story. Well, let's pray for Jimmy Lai and his family. Golly, Jewess, his wife must be just really you know, strong and faithful and zealous because her words are amazing wonderful to me. Woman. Absolutely wonderful. wonderful. We'll be posting the links wonderful to these articles. Too. God bless you, Mark. Have a great day. Merry Christmas to you. Thank you again for your time. We'd love to have Merry you back. Merry Christmas. All the best. Thank you. Take your day. That's Bye-bye, everybody. That's going to do it Take for care. us. Bye-bye. We'll see you guys in the after show. We'll be back live on Wednesday. God bless you. God love you, and Merry Christmas.